Next up is Jason Rasgon to discuss OO site technologies. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Jason Rasgon. I'm a professor of disease epidemiology in the Department of Entomology. And it's uh, my pleasure to produce our uh, patent pending technology to you. It's uh, an, what's called oocyte targeting technology. And so what our IP is, is a platform technology to deliver biomolecules to eggs from the circulatory system of adult females. And this is exploiting highly conserved egg development pathways that pretty much every egg bearing animal has, all the way from insects, all the way up to platypuses. Um, and it has very diverse applications ranging from pest control to animal health. And so basically for any of these organisms, when you're talking a mosquito, a fish, a chicken, um, pretty much anything that lays an egg, you can introduce um, these biomolecules, modified biomolecules into the circulatory system where they will target and enter the developing eggs. Uh, we call this method remote control. It stands for receptor mediated over retransduction of cargo. And it's a, a method my lab developed um, to do genetic engineering in arthropods. And so we've developed um, peptide, short peptide ligands ranging from about 8 to 40 amino acids that bind to specific receptors on the ovaries. And then they, if you fuse these ligands to anything, could be a protein, DNA, double-stranded RNA, a virus, a bacterium, a drug, any kind of a biomolecule or structure, um, when these things bind to the ovaries, they will get taken up during the process of egg development. And you inject these directly again into the circulatory system. And it results in injecting a female and modifying the offspring according to whatever your application is. Um, we've already used this, um, fusing it to Cas9 to do CRISPR editing of key species. It's enabled first-time genetic editing of species we weren't able to do before, such as ticks or white flies. And it's enabling new research development um, for control strategies for um, arthropod pest control. It also has significant animal health applications. Um, for instance, in ovo um, poultry vaccination, where you can inject uh, a chicken and essentially vaccinate all of the offspring for potential diseases. Gene editing for disease resistance in shrimp, control of sea lice, which are an important salmon pest. Uh, and then um, easy genetic engineering of fish, poultry, and other egg-laying animals. Uh, the value proposition is it can reduce up to 95% um, equipment and operating costs. It's very wide, uh, has very wide application, can work in just about any egg-laying animal. And again, you can manipulate embryos that you couldn't normally do. Uh, Two-phase business model, we're thinking first of marketing uh, a kit. We have a ligand that works in 90% of all arthropods. And we can design specific ligands that work um, in pretty much anything you want. And then for a second um, phase, strategic partnering with um, uh, corporations to target specific applications in animal health uh, and public health. So this is our team, myself on the science side and Scott Welsh on the business side. And thank you very much. So genetic modification is fairly new. CRISPR is, you know, relatively new. What kind of regulatory uh, risks are there to this? Because a lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of resistance right now in the market to genetically modified sure. uh, foods. Um, you know, what you're looking at is genetically modified uh, Animals. Uh, so it depends a little bit on where you are. So at the moment, you can use this technology just to essentially delete um, parts of the genome, so uh, making base pair deletions. In the United States, that's, that is not regulated as a genetically modified organism because yeah. you're not adding anything, yeah. you're just taking away. In Europe, it is. So the regulatory um, procedures will differ a little bit depending on where your market is. Um, but these kind of things happen naturally all the time. So I don't think, and this technology doesn't add anything new to the regulatory process that's already there um, for the use of CRISPR for mod modifying animals. So, so given that and some of the potential regulatory risks that might be coming, mm -hmm. um, where do you see your initial market? Uh, um, initially, market? the low-hanging fruit is in essentially research um, applications for arthropod genetic manipulation. Um, because we have ligand, we have essentially a prototype kit that's ready to go. It can be scaled up. Um, we can um, easily make the, the reagents at, at scale. We've already worked this out. Um, there are potentially thousands of laboratories that would be, just even academic laboratories, that would be interested in using this technology. Um, we've had direct contact with over 100 already in 10 countries. Uh, and then also, um, 
uh, biotech companies, um, ag pharma that would be interested in doing things from a research perspective, not necessarily for modifying things that are going to enter the food chain. But anything you would be involved in would have to be labeled from a consumer standpoint <coughs> as genetically modified. Again, it depends on where. So in the okay. U.S., no, it would not have to be um, if we were not inserting something, if you're just altering things. That's not regulated as a GM organism okay. in the U.S. So your business plan is initially to license the IP for pest control. Is that like step uh, one? Again, um, the, the, it could be if that's the application. The, okay. the initial, I think, um, low-hanging fruit, the first step would be to essentially sell kits to people to use for whatever application they desire. It could be pest control. It could be basic research. It could be um, uh, improvement. It really depends on what um, the, the, the modification needs to be. I always say when people look at this, they say, well, what gene do you want to modify? I always say, the question is, what gene do you want to modify? Because we're, we're basically have, developing a method that people can use for whatever their application is of interest. And again, your the, the the methodology is you can modify a gene in the egg through through essentially the the mother the the female carrier. That's one application. So again, we've used CRISPR as our use case here. So the technology, the IP, is not CRISPR or genetic modification. The IP is ovary targeting and germline targeting. And so in this case, we're we're targeting Cas9 to the germline to show that it works, and there are applications involved with that. But you could be interested, just hypothetically, in delivering a drug to chicken ovaries or something like that. The same technology can be used for that, where you're not modifying the genome. So it's, it's the targeting ligands that are the IP, not the CRISPR itself. Can you help me understand, you said you had to inject it into the circulatory yes. system. So that would mean taking a chicken, getting a vein, and injecting it. Yes. So it, in terms of scalability, it would be more of a research or? Again, it, it depends. Definitely, I think it will be very useful for research. It's enabled us uh, to be able to approach research questions that were literally impossible before we had developed this okay. technology. Um, for, but I, I could see um, potential applications um, partnering um, over retargeting with vaccination and things like that, where it could be used at more of an industrial scale uh, to basically improve uh, and make more cost effective some of the various processes that people are already doing um, in, in the, the, the food chain development and things like that. Once you inject that chicken, though, its offspring and everything downstream from that would be uh, modified, the genetically uh, again, modified. Again, if it's CRISPR, the offspring would be modified. If it's a drug okay. or a vaccine, it would not be. It would just be treated the way they normally would be. So how will you manage, let's say I'm having a bad day at Blue Tree and I want to create some killer mosquitoes and, you know, launch them to all my, you know, enemies. How will you, how will you prevent or guard against somebody taking that technology and using it for evil purposes? Uh, that's an excellent question, and I think that's um, a problem that's not limited to this. It's limited to the technology that's already currently available. I mean, you look at the, you know, the whole CRISPR baby fiasco of last year. That was people using currently available off-the-shelf stuff to modify people. So we're not really changing that. Um, we're just all, um, offering another way to do things. And I think it's personal responsibility and, and institutional regulations and, and federal regulations to stop people from doing that kind of stuff. That doesn't change with this technology. Okay, thank you. That was our last question. Thank you.